our LLS. I think you met me yesterday. So today, well, let me make a public service announcement first. There's a lovely man outside the gate. It's when you go through here on the covered area and you go through those white doors and you go into the outside air, you may have seen him. He's like at a little coffee stand and he does like espresso, cappuccino, americano, hot chocolate, it's, it's on the house, it's free. And I think nobody's patronizing him, and it really will set it up for you guys. And um, dare I say, it's a slightly better coffee than what you get inside here. So I told him that I would do this public service announcement. He's, his name is Tito. Not no, 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 but his name is Tito. So just remember, when you feel like I'm boring you too much, just get some coffee and that would um, solve the problem. So, I see our guest speaker is already on screen. Can you hear me, Professor? No, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah, yes, I can, sorry, uh, I was muted, yeah. Okay, I'm, all right, relax. I'm gonna give you a formal introduction that befits your status, so, um, mm -hmm. and then I'll call you in, okay? Is that all right? Yeah, of course. Great, Thank great, you. wonderful. All right. So, good afternoon, friends, colleagues. So, um, it's been another long day, but I hope you've had a very interesting and insightful day so far. I know you've heard a wide array of speakers and panelists. Um, you know, when we were putting together the program for this event, I kept on emphasizing to my team that we want people to explain what admittedly is some of them is really complex ideas, but we wanted them to convey it in, very, in a very sort of understandable way. Um, words that can connect with leaders and with policymakers and really put some inspiration behind the program of action, which would be called the Doha program of action. So in that vein, and by the way, I think it's a very difficult thing to do. Sometimes you watch like these business shows like CNBC and you hear them talking about these very complicated economic concepts and the really, really good ones make it so comprehensible, so easy for the layperson to understand. And that's why I'm so glad that we have Professor Hajun Chang with us today because our next speaker, the professor, is someone who has made it his life's mission to sort of rescue economics from the, ivory pot, from the ivory towers and make it accessible to the layperson. Um, and I'm gonna give you the titles of three of his books and you'll understand what I mean when I say that. And all three of these books are award-winning books and they tell the stories of what's inside them through their titles. So the first one that is called Economics, A User's Guide. So you see where he's coming from. The second one, 23 things that they don't tell you about capitalism. And then thirdly, kicking away the ladder. So these books are witty, the language is provocative, and it's written in a style that you wouldn't normally associate with an economics professor. 
with apologies to any of you that are economics professors outside there, but you know professors are normally very dry in terms of the theory, and that's not how he is at all. Um, he has spent a long time thinking seriously about how to communicate his ideas to the wider world. He connects his ideas to the people they affect each and every day. And I think that's a good lesson for us all. Professor Hajun Chang is a professor in the political economy of development out of Cambridge University. And he's been described as one of the world's top 20 thinkers by Prospect Magazine. He's somebody that thinks clearly and passionately about how to inject humanity into not just economics, but into capitalism itself. And about also, he thinks about how development policy works in reality and how it could work to better serve people. So I hope I'm not putting the bar too high for him, but with those few words, I'm honored to introduce him to you today. And um, we all await um, what he has to say. After he's finished his presentation, we can open it up and you can ask him some questions based on what you've heard from him today. So, Professor, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. The, thank you, the, the Undersecretary General, for that very, very generous uh, introduction. Yeah, today I want to give a short speech at, uh, about the need uh, for LDCs to transform their productive structure and the underlying productive capabilities. So let me bring up the, oh, hang on. Uh, can can I uh, share my screen? I have PowerPoint and Zoom says uh, host disabled screen sharing. Let me try. Yeah, nice. Okay, so. Let me begin. The, in the early, oh, are we? Uh, okay, what's going on? Let me try again. Did I? Uh, yeah, it is working, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Right, so <laughs> let me begin again. In the early days of decolonization between the 1940s and the 70s, there was a widespread consensus that developing countries, including the least developed countries, need to industrialize so that they can move away from primary commodities. Now, there were disagreements on exactly how to do it, there was that uh, firm consensus on the need to get out of uh, primary commodities, get into the manufacturing industries and upgrade the uh, productive uh, structure and capabilities. And indeed, uh, many developing countries made great strides in industrialization during this period. You know, unfortunately, since the 1980s, uh, those free market economists or neoliberal economists who have taken over have uh, done their best uh, to portray uh, the 50s, 60s, and 70s as a period of disaster in the, de the developing world. But actually, the developing world uh, grew much faster in those years uh, than in the subsequent neoliberal periods. I mean, I don't have time to go into that, but uh, for very complicated uh, reasons, neoliberalism uh, came to dominate our policy thinking, including development policy thinking since the 1980s. And since then, the developing countries have been discouraged from uh, the industrialization on the ground that uh, 
manufacturing industries are not where they have their comparative advantages and they need to focus on things they are relatively good at. You know, this idea of comparative advantage is often misunderstood. I mean, the, I heard actually the even quite prominent economists saying things like, oh, such and such poor country in Africa doesn't have comparative ad advantage in anything, but that's wrong. I mean, that's that uh, logical impossibility. Comparative advantage uh, simply means that you should, uh, uh, you may be bad at everything, but you should uh, 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 specialize in things at which you are least bad at. So it's comparative advantage. You are not comparing yourself with other countries. It's uh, that you're comparing different activities that you could be doing. Anyway, so the, the, on this ground, the developing countries were discouraged from trying to the, the change their productive structure and capabilities. At most, the, the, it was recommended that the, if uh, developing countries want to industrialize, they should uh, do it through unconditional integration into global value chains. Uh, so do whatever menial task uh, that, that uh, they, the international corporations give you and, and just uh, leave it to those uh, companies and market forces uh, to take your economy upward. And during this uh, period, especially in the case of LDCs, uh, development was unfortunately reduced to basically meeting basic needs, fighting poverty, and investing in health and ed education. Now, these are all extremely important things. I don't mean to kind of uh, undervalue the, uh, these things, but uh, as uh, embodied in the MDGs, uh, the, you know, there was no notion that uh, these countries need to change uh, the, the nature of their activities. They, these countries need to uh, accumulate uh, new capabilities and so on. Fortunately, in the last decade or so, things have uh, shifted in the right direction. You know, the, the most uh, prominent example of the, this being the adoption of SDGs, which uh, the include a much broader set of goals, but uh, especially including the, the, the goals related to production, employment, and productivity. And a lot of uh, the countries have come to realize that uh, they are not going to get out of uh, their current uh, the state of uh, economic difficulties by simply relying on the, the market forces and uh, sticking with that, uh, whatever they're already doing, you know, the, what nature has given them. But then actually, when you think about it, it's not the nature that has uh, given a lot of things that uh, you are doing today. You know, the, from when did Ghana grow cocoa? You know, it was uh, brought that uh, to the, the Ghana the, by British uh, the imperialists. You know, the, from when did Malaysia grow the, the, the rubber? It was uh, the, the stolen from uh, Brazil by the British and brought to the uh, Malaysia. So, uh, you know, actually a lot of these natural endowments are not natural at all. You know, the, just think about it, you know, coffee in the, the Latin America, coffee is the, the African, uh, crop, you know, the, the tea in the, the Sri Lanka, you know, teas uh, from China, you know. So the, there's nothing natural about these uh, so-called natural resources. But anyway, the countries are increasingly recognizing that, uh, that we, uh, they need to get out of uh, the, uh, this uh, state of affairs by upgrading their productive structure and capabilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's uh, not that uh, ready yet. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, indeed, uh, the, the history of capitalism, which I wrote about uh, in these books, uh, Kicking on the Ladder, Bad Samaritans, history of capitalism actually shows that the rich countries uh, that preach uh, to developing countries that they should develop their economies along uh, uh, sorry, according to the, the, what the market dictates, develop their own economies through various uh, the measures that they recommend against uh, these days. Yeah? So they use the trade protectionism, um, you know, especially the Britain and the, the US uh, use the very high protectionism, but the uh, average industrial 
tariff rates are reaching 40-50% in their respective uh, protectionist period. They use the direct subsidies, uh, they subsidize long-term loans by state-owned banks, they regulated uh, foreign direct investment very heavily. Not all of them, but uh, many of them used uh, the state-owned enterprises uh, extensively. They uh, had uh, very lax uh, intellectual property right uh, laws uh, so that their own uh, people could uh, uh, freely borrow the technologies uh, from uh, more advanced countries, you name it. Yeah? Now, when I recommend this uh, type of uh, policies by looking at the historical experiences, people have various reactions, uh, but uh, one of them is, yeah, maybe the, these policies work uh, for you know, the US, uh, the Germany, the Sweden, Japan, but how can an LDC do these kind of things? Yeah? But let me tell you, there's an LDC that has achieved this in one living uh, our living memory that uh, proves that uh, these uh, policies are feasible for these countries. Yeah? And that country is, uh, the, yeah, let me be a bit uh, nationalistic, my own native South Korea. You know, in 1961, on the eve of uh, its uh, start of uh, ambitious uh, development program in 1962, South Korea's uh, per capita income was uh, $93. Okay, it wasn't as uh, poor as uh, countries like Nepal or ha Haiti, but uh, it was uh, one of the poorest countries in the world. Is that the income level was uh, basically at the same level as uh, that of India, Kenya, Nigeria. You know, many African countries are that, that, that far richer than uh, Korea. You know, Ghana had that uh, per capita income that's uh, that more than twice. Uh, you know, Senegal was uh, at nearly three and a half times. At the time, the country was uh, reliant on uh, primary commodities like uh, tungsten oil, rice, fish. No different from that of today's LDCs. But today's uh, per capita income is uh, more than $30,000 and its main exports are sophisticated manufacturing uh, products like semiconductors, mobile phones, and automobiles. And I think uh, the best uh, the illustration of uh, this uh, structural uh, transformation based on upgrading of uh, productive capabilities. That's uh, the important thing. You know, the country didn't become rich because it found oil or the uranium or whatever. It uh, achieved it by building uh, the more sophisticated uh, productive capabilities with a combination of uh, private sector initiative and very uh, the sophisticated uh, the trade and industrial policies implemented by the government. And the best example of this is uh, the, the, the Korean automobile the manufacturer Hyundai. Now, Hyundai uh, started as a joint venture with uh, the Ford in the late, uh, started this uh, automobile manufacturing uh, in the late 60s as a joint venture with Ford. I mean, it's a conglomerate that uh, engaged in many different uh, businesses. And the initial the operation was uh, basically the importing uh, you know, semi-knockdown kits uh, from uh, Ford and assembling one of uh, Ford uh, models, uh, Cortina, and then selling them locally. Its uh, production run was at uh, not even 3,000. And in 1973, prompted uh, the, by government announcement that the Korean government wants uh, the automobile industries uh, uh, to indigenize and demanded that, that, that they that, uh, start producing locally designed models. And yeah, some of the foreign companies that, that uh, were operating in Korea in the way of joint venture left uh, saying this is a ridiculous demand. And yeah, Ford left. Hyundai was uh, left alone, and it designed its own car and uh, started uh, its uh, production in uh, 1976. There's a small hatchback called Pony, and as you can guess from the name and uh, 
uh, the way it looks, uh, it was more of a kind of four wheels and an ashtray uh, kind of a car, nothing uh, sophisticated. In the first uh, full year of production, Hyundai in 1976, uh, Hyundai produced 10,000 cars, which was that, uh, you know, three times bigger than what it used to with the Ford model, but still 10,000 cars. You know, in the same year, General Motors produced 4.8 million cars, Ford produced 1.9 million cars. Yeah, yeah so just think about it, that uh, you invent a time machine, fly back to 1976, and tell people that this this unknown car manufacturer, well, more of a glorified car mechanic shop in this uh, poor country called South Korea, you know, South Korea had that, that 15 years of rapid growth, uh, but uh, given where it started, it was still a very poor country. So, uh, per capita income in 1976 was not even that, uh, well, not even two thirds that, uh, that of uh, Ecuador's. And if you told people that uh, this, this uh, that, that, uh, new two-bit company from this uh, poor country called Korea, which currently has production run that is 0.2% of General Motors and 0.5% of uh, Ford, but uh, this company will be bigger than Ford in just over 30 years, and it will produce more cars than General Motors in that uh, less than 40 years, what do you think people would have done it, uh, done? They would have uh, tried to put you in a mental hospital. Mm -hmm. But this is what happened, that uh, as from uh, 2009, Hyundai produced, uh, uh, has been producing more cars than Ford. And in uh, 2015, it overtook General Motors. And, you know, it's uh, cars that uh, look like this uh, these days. Yeah? You know, this is a kind of a transformation that has to be achieved. And this is a kind of transformation that is possible even for an LDC. You know, if uh, someone tries to tell me that there's something special about uh, the Koreans that uh, only they could do this kind of thing, you know, jumping from uh, an LDC to, uh, to uh, one of the richest countries in the world uh, in the, the, the less than the 60 years, out the call the personal races. There's nothing special about Koreans, you know, anyone can do it. Of course, uh, this doesn't mean that you can just uh, copy what the Koreans did in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you need to uh, the revise and up update the uh, policies according to your own conditions and uh, changes in the world that uh, conditions. So, I mean, I cannot go into that, that, that what I think uh, should be done now that uh, in terms of individual countries, but uh, you know, uh, please don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not that, that trying to sell the Korean model or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that if you do the right things, it is possible. Yeah? Now, what uh, can the international community do to help the LDCs achieve a uh, structural transformation of this kind. I mean, there are many things. I mean, the, the last session was that, uh, talking about uh, financing and you know, many issues, but uh, let me just uh, focus on uh, a couple of things that I know most about. First of all, I think there has to be a reform of the global economic system. You know, since the rise of neoliberalism, the global economic system has been changed in such a way that uh, developing countries get much less allowance for the disadvantages that uh, they have. Yeah? You know, in the old days, uh, there was a uh, the recognition that uh, different countries need uh, different uh, uh, policies and different conditions. So there was actually quite a lot of policy space, uh, so to speak, uh, available for developing countries. But uh, since the 1980s, especially since the launch of the WTO uh, in 1995, the developing countries have been forced to more or less do follow the same rules as uh, the rich countries. Of course, uh, there is uh, the, for many things that uh, uh, was a longer transition period, but uh, that's about it. Yeah? 
LDCs that uh, get a greater allowance uh, for their the, the disadvantages, for example, they can use export subsidies that other countries are not uh, allowed to use, but they are given only a very short transition period when they graduate from LDC status, creating probably even disincentive uh, for graduation. I've been involved in the, the CDP, the Committee for Development Policy, which assesses uh, the, the LDC status. And you know, it's uh, the clear that uh, the many of these countries need much longer transition period. Also, there are formal and informal pressures uh, from the rich country governments, international lending institutions, and international investors on LDCs and other developing countries not to even use the allowance they have uh, in the WTO system. So, for example, you know, the, in terms of tariff, uh, the, the most uh, developing countries bound their tariffs at relatively high levels at like 25%, 30%. Many LDCs that uh, didn't bind uh, any of their tariff, but in practice, most of these countries use very low tariff. Uh, the average industrial tariff rate for developing countries these days is about 10%, you know, way, way below what they could be using, way, way below the, what the US, uh, the UK, South Korea, Japan used uh, when they were uh, trying to de uh, develop their economies. Typically, these countries had 30, 40, 50% uh, the average tariff rate. Why? Because uh, these developing countries, even knowing that uh, they could uh, use higher tariff, are always under the pressure to the, the have a lower tariff. Yeah? So I think uh, we need to uh, the reform the global economic system to create what I call asymmetric protectionism. Yeah? Poorer countries should be allowed to use more policy tools that give them, if you like, unfair advantages to make up for the, the structural the deficiencies uh, they have, uh, to make up uh, for the weak power they have in the international negotiations, and to give them time to upgrade uh, their productive structure and capabilities. As the countries develop, uh, these uh, that, uh, allowance uh, should be gradually reduced, not done in a kind of guillotine kind of way uh, as it is uh, uh, done uh, with uh, LDC's uh, graduation. And I think it's uh, very important that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, recognized. I mean, we talk about it all the time, but we need to really uh, put our mind to it uh, so that disadvantaged countries uh, can have uh, more room for maneuver. Now, one thing I uh, want to point out is that, uh, you know, that a lot of people have become very skeptical about the active role of the state uh, since the launch of the WTO system. Basically, they think uh, there's uh, uh, nothing they can do. This is uh, true. You know, I uh, sometimes joke that uh, the WTO has become the best friend of uh, lazy bureaucrats in developing countries because when the minister wants you to do something, all you have to do is uh, to tell him that this is banned by the WTO. You know, the minister is not going to run to the library and go through 800 pages of uh, WTO agreement. So uh, there are actually a lot of uh, room for maneuver. Of course, uh, reduced uh, than before, uh, all in terms of uh, the, the tariff subsidies, regulation of FDI and so on. And actually I have a, a, a chapter in this report that I authored, uh, co-authored uh, for, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, detailing what countries can actually do given the, the, what the, they are allowed in the formal system. This uh, the, the report is uh, freely downloadable from ECA website, so uh, please take a look at it. The second thing that, uh, and, and I should uh, finish very quickly, uh, that the international community can do to help LDCs is to accelerate knowledge transfer. Because that, uh, now that uh, LDCs have uh, even greater challenge of uh, knowledge uh, absorption than before, you know, there's uh, climate change uh, that requires uh, deployment of a whole set of alternative technologies. There's uh, the, the so-called fourth industrial revolution uh, going on. I uh, do not believe that we are actually yet in the fourth 
industrial revolution, but uh, as a shorthand, I would say so-called uh, fourth industrial revolution, which require acquisition of uh, the, the abilities uh, to combine different technologies and uh, cross uh, sectoral boundaries, because uh, the, the, the most important thing about the current phase of uh, technological change is not simply this technology, that technology, is that, that, that fusion of technologies, the breaking down of uh, sectoral barriers. You know, a friend of mine who works as uh, one of the top executives at, uh, of Hyundai already several years ago told me that uh, he doesn't uh, that, uh, know anymore whether his company is a mechanical company or, or electronics uh, company because so many of things that go into cars these days is uh, electronic. Yeah? You know, digital technologies are now being used for agriculture and mining and so on. So, you know, the, there's a the much greater need that, uh, for LDCs uh, than before to absorb a whole new range of uh, the technologies and new range of capabilities. And yeah, I mean, that, uh, frankly, that they can do it alone. There has to be more aggressive uh, effort to transfer the technologies and help uh, these countries uh, to acquire the new capabilities. Okay, I think I uh, have uh, run out of time, so let me uh, finish here and uh, maybe uh, take one or two questions if uh, there's uh, a few minutes that are left. Thank you very much, Professor. We have actually had a couple of questions that were submitted to us by some of the delegates here today. And if we do have time, uh, well, I'll read the questions for you. You can answer them seriatim, one, one at a time. And if we have a little bit more time, I can open it up to the audience and get some more. But um, given what you have said, I mean, I'm, I'm going to read these questions against, in the context of some of the points that you are making. Principally, the, one of the main points which I got from what you just said is that today there is much more limited policy space for developing countries um, than there used to be in the past. And with respect to the short transition periods post-graduation, we know in this room that the 16 of the 46 LDCs that are in the graduation pipeline, so to speak, are racked with a fair degree of anxiety over the process of some of the support measures that the international community is providing to them being summarily withdrawn upon graduation. So that obviously is something that is, is causing quite a bit of anxiety amongst those in the graduation pipeline. We also hear what you say about the, the prevailing tariffs, which are relatively lower today, and, and the need for, developing, for developed countries to accelerate the process of knowledge transfer. The first question that was submitted to us is how could LDCs strengthen their production, their productive capacity, given the low industrialization of their economies? So if you could probably give us a short response to that, and then I will read out a, a couple more, and then hopefully just open it up to the audience for some more. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, the, on the, your the own point, uh, under Secretary General, that yeah, I think it's uh, the, really concerning that uh, LDC graduation means that uh, having to meet a huge uh, range of uh, the additional requirements. You know, this uh, problem, but uh, wouldn't exist uh, if we had uh, like uh, five, six, seven different categories uh, in the WTO system. You know, if uh, the graduation doesn't mean the jumping from uh, I don't know the ten to sixty but uh, uh, jumping from 10 to 20 and then 30 to 40, it would uh, uh, be a lot uh, uh, easier. I mean, uh, because the, the problem is that uh, essentially there's that uh, in the W2 system, there's everyone and then LDCs, yeah? So how can you expect that uh, LDCs uh, to become like every, you know, uh, you have to realize that, that, that some of the, uh, the gap between the rich countries and uh, the upper middle the income countries is actually smaller than the gap between upper middle income countries and the LDCs. Yeah? And they are given like three, five years uh, to jump from you know, uh, LDC uh, to uh, uh, the upper middle income. Yeah? 
in terms of uh, the, what they are allowed to do. So I think uh, we need to reform that too. Now, how can you uh, uh, develop productive capabilities that uh, when you have such low level of industrialization? No, this is a uh, uh, really the important question. Unfortunately, it's a bit uh, over chicken and egg because uh, productive cap capability development happens at the fastest in the manufacturing sector. So you have to kind of somehow kickstart uh, some manufacturing activities in order to uh, develop uh, your pro productive capabilities in general. But uh, you know, if you go back to the Korean example, you know, it may have uh, moved very quickly through these uh, stages, but it didn't jump from but, uh, selling tungsten ore to you know, making steel overnight. It didn't jump from but, uh, the selling rice at, uh, to manufacturing semiconductors overnight. I mean, it went through various uh, stages. So the, initially they focused on the low value added, very labor intensive manufacturing, you know, including making human weak. You know, the, the, apparently at the time, but uh, you had to plant each strand of hair on whatever you are putting on your head when you're wearing a wig and it was very labor intensive. So they started with those things and then moved to slightly more sophisticated things like uh, the putting together transistor radios, you know, uh, the assembling uh, the black and white TV, and then they moved into the, the making steel, you know, uh, making color TV. Yeah? And even within the same industry, you know, you saw the first Korean car, which was a bit of a joke. You know, you keep uh, improving. So, you know, that I don't want you to get the uh, wrong impression that I'm recommending uh, jumping from, you know, rice uh, farming to the aircraft making overnight. You know, you have to go through these steps, but that uh, you need to uh, get that uh, some of these uh, the industry activities started if you want to uh, develop uh, the productive capabilities. Thank you. You know, Professor, thank you. Um, when I look at the three questions that were submitted by um, three different delegations here, you know, thematically, I mean, they're very similar. I'm going to actually read the, the second and the third one in conjunction because all three of them, in my view, relate to the first one. And it, it, it actually reveals the anxiety that I referred to before. The second question that we received are, is, how can LDCs adjust to the loss of preferential market access? And the third one says, trade liberalization in LDCs has not only eroded trade protections, but further constrained their limited fiscal space. Mm. How will an LDC with low productivity and lack of product diversification face these multiple challenges in these uncertain times. And I think they're referring to the COVID pandemic. Mm -mm. So um, I see them sort of of a piece <laughs> with the first one yeah, as well. Yeah, sure, yeah. Right. So if you wanted to add anything to what you originally yeah, no, said. No, no, the, the yeah, very important questions. Yes, I mean, the, the second question, the, the loss of preferential market access, I mean, this uh, would not be a worry if uh, the pre preferential market access was uh, graduated uh, uh, to your income. So instead of zero or one, if it uh, uh, could uh, be gradually reduced as uh, you become richer, this uh, won't be a worry. But as I said earlier, in the WTO, there's uh, basically you know, only two categories. I mean, the, the LDCs and everyone else. And LDCs, when they graduate, is not really everyone else. I mean, they cannot behave like everyone else, but they are made to. So I think that that, that uh, requires uh, serious uh, that, 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 uh, reform. Yeah, the issue of uh, the fiscal space is uh, very, very uh, the important. You know, basically, the, the, you know, the economists don't understand that, that the tax collection is uh, very the kind of uh, much dependent on the, the ability and the resources of the government. So the other things being equal, poorer countries tend to rely more on the tariffs. 
not necessarily because that uh, they want to use it uh, to promote uh, certain industries, but because that's the easiest tax to collect. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, even the IMF uh, in one of the working papers that uh, published in mid 2000s admitted that developing countries that uh, on average recovered only about one third of uh, lost revenue coming from uh, the trade liberalization. That's a huge uh, the hit. And at the same time, the IMF was uh, telling these countries to balance your budget. So how do you, you know, the balance your budget when the, your main source of uh, the tariff, uh, sorry, the government revenue was uh, eliminated? So I think uh, that, that once again, uh, that we need to kind of drop this uh, the unfairly negative view of tariff. I mean, the tariffs that uh, serve many functions. I mean, it could be, you know, the abuse that uh, to protect totally inefficient producers that, uh, who have no wish uh, to upgrade, but uh, if it's uh, combined with other incentives, it is a great tool to push uh, producers, uh, uh, sorry, allow producers uh, to uh, promote uh, their productivity. You know, that it's an uh, important source of government revenue, especially for poor countries with uh, the, uh, little uh, resource and manpower in the government. So that we need to that, uh, review that uh, as well. I mean, the, unfortunately, the economists are not in the habit of uh, the, what some people call joined up thinking. You know, the, they think if uh, the, the one policy is correct, they should just uh, the, the impl uh, we should just implement it, whatever the consequences uh, of it, uh, for the other things in the, our society and economy. Yeah, let me leave it there. Yeah, I want to harken back to something that you said during your earlier remarks about Korea. I mean, because from time to time you hear about the Korean model. And what I got from what you were saying is that there is no Korean model per se. It's not sui generis in, in that sense. It is something that can be replicated um, with account being taken of the current environment. Obviously, adjustments have to be made. But it's something that is not unique to Korea. It's something that LDCs can do um, Today, um, you want to say a little bit? I mean, what we're here yeah, doing yeah. is to try and find a blueprint for the sort of structural transformation that needs to take place. But it hasn't, take place, it hasn't taken place since 1971 to now. Very little of that has happened, you know. Yes, uh, the, no, it, uh, the reason why I try to show the, the kind of... Uh, historical record of today's rich countries in that, that, that they implemented all these that, that interventionist that trade and industrial policies, which are usually associated with a few countries in the East Asia, like Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. You know, by showing that, actually, that, that I'm, I'm that trying to argue that there's no such thing as one single right model, you know, that, uh, but uh, there is this uh, the principle that run through all of these uh, the different um, models of uh, economic development, which is basically that, that uh, you need to initially provide protection and nurturing to young uh, the industries, industries that uh, may already exist uh, abroad, but that uh, you don't have the uh, industries that you, uh, at the moment, that. Uh, uh, in which that uh, you at the moment uh, cannot compete, but that uh, you want to in the future. And, you know, indeed, uh, this principle was uh, first uh, practiced uh, by Britain in the 18th century. It was first theorized by Alexander Hamilton, the first uh, finance minister or the, the treasury secretary of the, the United States. And it was uh, used uh, repeatedly by the, the Germany, Sweden, and then France. And, you know, so that, this is actually the, the, the very important uh, uh, message because you know it's very easy to dismiss uh, something, some model, some principle if it's that, that, that used by only one or two countries. You can always uh, find reasons why. Oh, yeah, Korea may have uh, used uh, protection, but they had this, they had that. You know, 
God knows, I mean, the ethnic homogeneity and the, the confrontation in North Korea, you know, U.S. support, all of these are the, the, the not really true, but the, the, it sounds plausible. But when you know, can show that the 25, 30 countries repeatedly use the same principles, although in very different, uh, uh, using uh, very different policy mixes, then the, 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 you have to take those uh, principles that, uh, seriously. Huh? Yeah. So I think it's that, uh, extremely important not to talk about you know, Korean model or the German model or the Swedish model. There is a set of uh, principles that, that uh, all countries that, that, that have used. And uh, exactly what you use that, uh, really depends on who you are, what uh, the global economic condition is, that, uh, where you want to get to. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to open it up to the floor now. I mean, you know, I think we have to take account of the environment in which we are today and how realistic is it to think that we, in 2021, can apply the principle of asymmetric protectionism that you're talking about. What, you know, what realistically um, are we able to do? But let me open it up to, to colleagues. Um, is anybody that wants to engage with the professor or ask him a question, make a point on what he has said? Yes, please. Merci, Monsieur le Représentant. Merci, Monsieur le Professeur. De, de nous faire rêver, c'est l'impression que j'ai. Comme it's, it's le disait le, le sous-secrétaire. That's how I see it. Right now. way forward for us. Thank you. Professor, did you get that? Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. sorry. I uh, the, the, the located the translation button uh, a bit too late, so I lost uh, the, the first uh, half of the question. Uh, I unfortunately cannot uh, speak French. Uh, so can you, can someone uh, quickly summarize uh, what the speaker was saying? Is um, I wasn't hearing the translation. Either. All right, yeah, um, okay. I don't know. Yeah, well, the, the, in that case, I think I can guess uh, what uh, he was trying to say. Yeah, I mean, the, it's uh, difficult for countries with uh, very little bargaining power the, to do things uh, the, the, against uh, the global system. But first of all, you know, I repeat that there are a lot of things that are allowed. Yeah? You can do things, and as LDC says, you have some extra room for maneuver. Secondly, the, you know, these rules that, that, you know, you have to be street smart about it. You know, you have to exploit the loopholes, you know, that, that you have to that operate under the radar. You know, and that, as a the, the, the poor LDC, that probably that, the rich countries are not going to descend upon you uh, immediately if you did uh, something uh, that, uh, slightly off the book because uh, that they don't uh, probably uh, pay too much attention to you. But uh, of course, that uh, together, we all need to uh, work together uh, to call for systemic reform because uh, eventually, without systemic reform, there's a limit uh, to what you, you can do by exploiting loopholes and uh, operating under the radar. Let me leave it at that. Oh, I, I see that uh, the Joe Stiglitz has uh, joined us, uh, so probably I should uh, uh, shut up now and <laughs> and the floor to you. Well, not shut up, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please. And um, as Professor Ha Jun Chang has said, we are joined now by Professor Joseph Stiglitz. We're honored to have him with us today. Um, so I will do it a little bit different here. I will ask him some questions on my own behalf, and then I will pose some questions to Professor Stiglitz that have again been sub submitted by some of you. 
And then if we have time at the end, I'll open it up for engagement with the wider audience here. Um, it's difficult to know where to begin with an introduction of somebody of um, such prestige. Um, and I really am not even going to attempt to list all of Professor Stiglitz's honors, awards, and publications. I think we would run out of time. But let me just say, um, I do want to highlight some aspects of his biography. Um, as you probably all know, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist and best-selling author, also a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank, former member and chairman of the U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors. He was named by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Currently, he's a professor at Columbia University and he's also the co-chair of the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress at the OECD. And the last one that I would highlight is that he is the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. This, I think, colleagues, is just a flavor of the work that Professor Stiglitz has done and, and continues to do. Um, many of you here will be familiar with his work that focuses on income distribution, risk, corporate governance, public policy, macroeconomics, and of course, globalization. So Professor Stiglitz, thank you so much for joining us at um, what is the UN's first ever quote-unquote future forum for the least developed countries. Um, you join us at a particularly crucial time for these vulnerable countries as we seek to build support ahead of their new 10-year program of action, which will be launched next January, from the 23rd to the 27th of January next year at Doha in Qatar. So, um, as I said, Professor, you know, let me just ask you some questions, um, if you can just answer them. As the, you know, I'm not going to just read out all of them, but let me ask you the first one and get you to respond at some point We'll just try and open it up for some more questions from the floor. So, um, trade, as you know, is an extremely important issue for least developed countries. And these countries historically struggle to increase their share of global trade. In your view, what more can they do to close that gap? Well, let me first uh, try to explain. There's some confusion about the role of trade. Um, it's sometimes been exaggerated because the magnitude of the trade uh, depends on uh, the state of the world. In uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, trade was mostly in commodities. Uh, there was a lot of trade, but it was basically taking resources from the least developed countries, less developed countries, and uh, uh, moving them to the advanced countries to be processed. It didn't actually promote growth in the less developed countries. Uh, it was a kind of exploitive trade. Then in the second half of the 20th century, trade involved a lot of manufacturing goods. And that was the basis of the growth of the East Asian countries. And there, in that era, trade did play an important role in development. But since 2008, roughly, there's been a major transformation of the economy, uh, a continuation of what's going on, but marked, uh, which is we moved to a service sector economy. And in a service sector economy, trade takes on less of an importance. And uh, that is one of the reasons why the global trade to GDP ratios have uh, gone down. Now, obviously for a small country, uh, a small island country, uh, trade is absolutely essential. You're not big enough to produce the goods that uh, one wants, uh, that, one, that one needs. So I think the way to think about it is more, how do we develop a comparative advantage that uh, 
allows others to want to get the goods that we produce. In some cases, it's tourism. And obviously, COVID-19 has been a disaster for, for tourism. But uh, I believe it's going to come back. Many people are anticipating uh, having been deprived of of uh, the joys of uh, seeing what's going on in other places. When it comes back, it'll come back uh, even stronger. Um, uh, there are, you know, other uh, niches in the product space that particular places can help uh, develop uh, the particular development of skills uh, of uh, resources. So I think the way to phrase it is not what can one do to promote trade, but uh, what can one uh, do to uh, promote those areas in which one uh, can uh, develop a, a comparative advantage, a dynamic comparative advantage that others uh, will uh, want to uh, uh, avail themselves of. Thank you. Let me ask you a question related to the prospects for economic growth. The part of the world that I come from in the Caribbean, which as you know, Professor, is heavily reliant on tourism. You know, it's one of the major external flows for countries in the Caribbean. And we saw an average in the Caribbean last year at the height of the pandemic. I mean, last year averaged a deceleration in GDP growth of 7% last year. This year, the prospects for growth in the Caribbean look much better. I mean, if the projections hold good, we're looking at a 6% GDP increase this year, 2021. But obviously not enough of an increase to wipe out the 7% decrease that we saw last year. And the situation, I think, is more dire for the least developed countries. But I do expect that um, all across the world, as the pace of acceleration of the vaccines picks up, you're going to see some rebounding. But, you know, they're starting from a very low level when it comes to vaccines. I mean, the figure for the amount of people in the LDCs that have been vaccinated is below 3%. So what do you think are the prospects for economic growth in these countries. Um, I know because of the pace of vaccine acceleration, it should pick up. But realistically, are these countries looking at another decade of lost growth? Another lost decade? Is that what you think is going to happen? So let me first uh, express uh, some optimism. I, I think it was uh, a very big uh, mistake, uh, a moral uh, mistake, but also a strategic mistake for the advanced countries not to have done a better job in making sure that everyone in the world had access to vaccines. In many ways, it was a miracle, our ability to produce uh, uh, these vaccines to identify the source of the uh, the virus that was causing COVID-19, develop a vaccine against it. It wasn't, I should say, a miracle. It was based on investments by governments in research that, that paid off at this critical time. And I want to emphasize it was investments by governments. And then governments said, we have to, having developed the basic idea of mRNA vaccine, uh, we have to uh, push it across the finishing line. Uh, we have to use that knowledge in fighting this uh, scourge. And they did that. But then they relied too much on markets to scale up the production. And the result, markets took advantage of market power, monopoly power. They didn't have the incentives to expand production in the way that you would, that the world needed. Uh, the United States should have used the War Production Act to expand production. Uh, the international community should have supported 
the efforts of South Africa and India at the WTO to have a waiver on the intellectual property rights related to COVID-19. And because we didn't do that, there's been this shortage of vaccines. But I think the world's waking up and I remain hopeful that within the not too distant future, we will have enough vaccines for everybody to be vaccinated. And uh, when that happens, I think the disease will be put under control. Uh, in the United States and Europe, you already feel the sense of opening up, travel is beginning again, tourism is picking up. And um, when you go to uh, some places uh, today, uh, Rome, and uh, you feel the vibrancy of people having been uh, locked down and uh, really, really happy to get uh, back into some kind of normalcy. So I'm optimistic that as you, the, the countries in your part of the world, the Caribbean, will actually have uh, be experiencing a a uh, uh, era of, of actually uh, strong economic growth. There's one other uh, aspect of this that worries me, of course, about a number of the countries, not all of them, but a number of the countries, uh, a number of them had high levels of debt before the crisis. And then uh, the pandemic lowered their income, increased their expenditures. Uh, every country in the world saw their debt rise significantly. But for those who began with a high level of debt, uh, the subsequent debt has pushed them over a critical threshold. And I worry about debt crises in many of the uh, developing countries, least developed countries. Um, there's uh, at the beginning of the um, uh, uh, pandemic, uh, there were G20, uh, IMF took leadership in uh, pushing for a uh, debt stay. But that was based on the hypothesis that the pandemic would be much shorter lived than it has been. It was based on the hypothesis that there would be cooperation with the private creditors. Unfortunately, the crisis, the pandemic has lasted far longer than was anticipated. And the private sector has been far less cooperative than one would have, one would have hoped. And so we are now in a situation what, that what is needed is a deep debt restructuring. Without that kind of debt restructuring, many countries will go, will face a debt crisis. And uh, those countries, I do worry about having uh, a lost decade. Let me just pick up on something. I, th I think you're completely right when you speak about the debt situation. I mean, in the LDCs, almost half of them are either in deep debt distress or already in default. There are four of them that are in default and 16 of them that are in debt distress, so quite a, quite a number. And um, you mentioned the initiatives that have been taken by the G20. We have the Debt Service Suspension Initiative that has been extended, as you know, to the end of this year. And then you have the Common Framework for Debt Treatment that tries to provide um, a little more in terms of actual debt relief and debt restructuring. But I agree with you. I think what we need in terms of the international debt architecture is the introduction of a sovereign debt um, mechanism and a mechanism that is robust enough to deal with the long-standing problem of holdout creditors. And I don't need to tell you about Elliott Management and Argentina and what they went through with respect to that. But, you know, we, we tried to have something like that, that, which, that was much more long-lasting back in 2014, 2015, coming through the UN. And um, there was stout resistance to that. And the prevailing view amongst the creditor countries was that, you know, if you want to talk about restructuring, you don't want to mandate anything like a statutorily-based sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. You really want to have debtors and creditors work it out through the private market themselves. And, you know, then we went into the problem of, you know, the collective action clauses 
and this whole new era, do you think the time has come for us on the UN side to revisit the issue of a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, maybe under the auspices of the United Nations and maybe with some statutory functions? Uh, very much so. Um, you know, when, when Argentina uh, went uh, to restructure its debt uh, uh, somewhat more than a year ago, um, it turned out that the collective action clauses uh, didn't work in the way that anybody had thought. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, back five, six years ago, uh, the hope was that the collective action clauses were, would facilitate a debt restructuring. And uh, they do help in one problem. They do help in the case where there is a single firm that is the holdout. Uh, you mentioned Elliot, um, and they played a very bad role in a large number of, of uh, uh, in a number of restructurings. But what happens when uh, uh, a number, uh, a majority of the creditors uh, are holdouts? Uh, the IMF and Argentina had done an analysis of debt sustainability. What was the most that Argentina could afford to pay without having another debt restructuring five years down the line? Uh, you know, more, more than half of all debt restructurings uh, wind up with another debt restructuring just a few years later. Uh, evidence of a phenomenon that I've written about called uh, Too Little Too Late. Uh, that the restructurings typically take a uh, long time to occur. And so when they finally occur, they're too late, too much suffering. And when they finally occur, they're too little. Um, the evidence is overwhelming. This is the pattern. And to me, it's not a surprise. Uh, restructuring sovereign debt, cross-border debt, debt involving many countries, different legal systems, is even more complicated than restructuring within a country. Within a country, virtually no country says, let's leave it out for the creditors and debtors to duke it out, to fight the uh, bargaining. We all have bankruptcy laws with bankruptcy judges that try to adjudicate, facilitate, uh, uh, debt restructuring. Uh, it should be clear that the reason we do that is that you need a legal framework and leaving it to bargaining is just doesn't work. Uh, it leads to a phenomenon too little, too late, uh, a breakdown of bargaining, uh, the powerful taking advantage of the weak. Uh, and we should have learned that lesson from the very fact of what we do within our countries, that given the difficulty of debt restructuring, uh, we do need a legal framework. A rule of law internationally is as important as a rule of law within a country. And bankruptcy turns out to be an important element of the rule of law. And I find it totally un, uh, uh, un understandable how countries like the United States say, we believe in the rule of law, but we don't think there should be a rule of law when it comes to restructuring debt. Uh, it, it, it is a total mystery to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is the time as so many countries uh, who are uh, uh, it, limited economic means are going to be facing uh, high levels of debt, debt distress. And there will have to be uh, something done. And the question is a really simple one. How much stress, distress, suffering, uh, deaths, uh, how much economic consequences do we want to have? Uh, remember, whenever a country gets uh, in debt too much, it's as much the result of bad lending as it is bad borrowing. Whenever you uh, have a loan, it's a transaction between a lender and a borrower. Nobody forced the, bar the lender to lend. And we tend to, to put the onus 
on the borrower, but uh, it's a voluntary transaction. And it's often the lenders who are at, really at fault because the lenders are the ones who are supposed to be the experts in risk analysis. Uh, unfortunately, it's often the lenders who push these loans in their short-sighted attempt to make uh, more money off of uh, those in desperate need. Yeah. Let me, let me just turn now to something that is just a, um, every time we have a conversation about the development prospects and trajectory of the LDCs, in fact, of any developing country, always seem to come back to a hardy perennial, which is how are we going to finance this? How are we going to finance um, our infrastructure needs, for example? And there are huge infrastructure needs across the LDCs. We all know that ODA is, is limited, so we're not going to be able to, to close the SDG gap or meet the financing needs of developing countries strictly from ODA. We all have constrained fiscal space, so domestic resource mobilization has proved challenging. And so, even with respect to crowding in the private sector through blended finance, that has not closed the investment gap related to the SDGs. I mean, I've, I mean, estimates are a bit all over the place. I've seen that the SDG financing gap is as low as $2.5 trillion for developing countries per year, $2.5 trillion, that's on the low side. I've seen estimates of $7 trillion a year that is needed, you know? But the fact of the matter is that the largest pool of private finance that is out there is intermediated through the capital markets. The, the latest figures that I have seen for assets under management is $103 trillion. But how to tap into that pool of funds is not easy. And you would think, just looking at it objectively, that this is a sort of money you know, that is um, managed by asset managers that you know, when, they, when they're managing money for pension funds and insurance companies, these are long-dated liabilities. You think that they would be ideally suited to the sort of long-term sustainable development investments that needs to be financed. And people look at it and say, well, there obviously is some market failure. There's a huge amount of cash that is out there. There is manifest demand on the other end, but the supply is just not meeting the demand. In your view, what needs to happen for developing countries and LDCs in particular to tap into that pool of assets that are under management, um, intermediated through the capital markets? Uh, you've put it exactly the way I often uh, do put it. Uh, it, it. It seems like a mystery. We have uh, countries that are in need of long-term finance. We have... Uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, pension funds that want long-term investment opportunities. And yet uh, there seems to be a gap. In fact, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, talked about a savings glut. And uh, you know, when he said that, I said, I don't know what planet you're living on, but I don't see a savings glut. I see a, uh, a, a lack of uh, money going for the investment projects that developing countries, emerging markets need. Uh, we need more savings, not less. And obviously between these long-term needs and the savers, many of whom are long-term, stands are short-term, financial markets, focusing on the next quarter. We have our banks, uh, our hedge funds that are thinking about, you know, a quarter is a long horizon for many of these uh, uh, financial uh, enterprises. So uh, one of the answers is strengthening development banks. And uh, that is a major change in perspective that has occurred in the last, uh, I'd say, five years, uh, uh, the recognition that development banks uh, play a very important role. Uh, the European Investment Bank, of course, is an enormous uh, development bank, uh, and it plays a critical role in financing investment in Europe. 
uh, the World Bank as a development bank. But as the world has confronted the challenge of climate change, even in my own state, New York State, we've created a, a green development bank because we realize the market is not going to uh, be adequate uh, in providing a flow of funds for the investments, the long-term investments that we need for the green transition. And that has happened in states and communities um, uh, all over the country and uh, all over the world. So I think one response is the great creation of more development banks. Uh, two examples of uh, recently created development banks focusing particularly on the green transition are the so-called new development bank created by the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, in which uh, Nick Stern and I uh, 